Hey, everybody. All right. Brett Moffat, Michael Gelfin, Dallas Morgan. Hey, Michael. Brett has been so consistent, so we haven't had a chance to ask you about a miss within 50. Uh, he had one. Just, yep. just curious what, uh, from your advantage, your conversation with him happened there. Yeah, he said that he didn't commit to it enough. And there was something, I think, as simple as just like swinging at it. You know, it was well within his range, obviously. And, you know, when you miss it right, usually it's kind of like a, yeah, I didn't commit to it or finish my swing, and maybe aimed it. And that's what ruined his Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> and I knew after the game, he was, we won the game, you know, and he was so mad. Because he knows also, you know, it ends the game. It makes it a three-score game and all those components. So um, I said, just put it in your memory bank. So every time you go out there, you know, anger picks a spot. You know, the snapper picks his spot. And you commit to your swing. And it's all healthy reminders. Is there a right way to handle disappointment as a player? Is it just so individual? Like, how do you help? Players, is it just to get out of his way and let him have his individual process after disappointment on the field? I think everybody's probably a little bit different. Um, most of the time I've learned is, you know, you smack him on the helmet or smack him on the ass and you say, you know, hey, you know, next time commit to your swing or you, know, you got to finish it, you know, come on, swing at it. And those guys have their own way of processing it and it's usually nothing you can really say to make him feel better <laughs> except give him a couple of days or get him back on the practice field like we got out and we swung today and he probably got it out of him today, but it probably took till today to kind of flush it, to be honest with you. I mean, it takes a long time sometimes to get over things, you know, especially when you make mistakes. If you do good things, you good calls or good plays, you know, you kind of enjoy it and you get over it pretty fast. But the ones that don't go well, I found out, even personally, you, you hang on to it a little bit more when it's like, damn, what was I thinking? You know, I should have done this instead of that, or I should have swung at it instead of, you know, aimed it. So, anyways, it's quite a mental game. John Michelle sure the Athletic, we didn't talk to you after the Vikings game. I just wanted to kind of hear your thought process on halftime. Right before halftime, he kicks the field goal, then they say there's a review and he has to kick again. What are you kind of thinking when that's going on, and what did you think of the way he was able to come back and you know hit the ball, the second ball even better? Than the yeah, first? I mean, that's part of it too. I mean, it's awesome. Football karma is crazy because you know, it has a way of bringing you from a high, back, crashing back down to earth, you know, and then you miss a kick and you're the low and football karma has a way to kind of bring you back up. So, <laughs> anyways, um, I was surprised. I didn't. I, we were starting to walk into the locker room. We got called back on the field, and I didn't know what happened until I found out that the officials iced our kicker. It's the first time in NFL history. <laughs> but I think from Brett's perspective, you know, he was he made the kick and it's like 60 yarder, and you know he was upset that they called it back. And he even said I had to refocus myself and get rid of my anger and refocus on the next kick because it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it didn't count, so I got to kick it again. So that was a great um, test of his kind of getting himself back to neutral, like we like to say a lot here, which is good. Um, so it was awesome, you know. So, I just love it. So it seems as though teams are somewhat trying to change how they're kicking or punting towards Kamate Turpin. Yeah. How do you adjust to their adjustment? How do you adjust to them changing their coverage or how they're doing things to not have to deal with Kamate Turpin? Yeah, that's a good question. It's really hard to figure out what to do on kickoff return because if the kicker wants to bang it, you know, we can we can back up and bring it out, which we could do that, and we've talked about that based on situations. Um, when they punt it, there's a little bit more you can do. Like I've talked about, sometimes you got to rush them to force them to punt it, but then you don't have as many blockers in the return game when you rush it. So it's quite a um, yin and yang from a coach's perspective. You know, okay, we, we pressure him to maybe get it out a little faster to give us a better chance in the return game, but then we lose blockers. You know, we, if, we, if we hold everybody up, then the punter's nice and comfortable and he hits a great directional punt and forces you to fair catch it. So it's like, I should have rushed it. You know, then you rush it, you don't have enough blockers. It's like, damn, I should have held them up. So it's, it's a game, yeah, it's a game. And a lot of times, it's, uh, to be honest with you, it's on punt return, you, you do some things and you hope that the punter just doesn't hit a really good ball. But when a punter hits a good ball, like uh, the Giants guy hit a couple of good balls, it's like, ah, I mean, it's a good punt, you know? You know, shake his hand and say, good punt, man, and, and negated some opportunities. John Jory of Stein Yahoo Sports. Jory. I know that Brett missed one this past week, but when you look at how good he's been, and particularly how good from deep, in recent weeks, 
has that changed the decision-making philosophy of the staff at all, do you think? And or do you all start to have conversations of, okay, we know we can, like the likelihood he'll make it from deep goes up here, so that'll change whether we go for it. Yeah, for sure. It's a great point. We, we have a discussion every week on if it's just a normal part of the game, what's our yard line for when we want to kick a field goal, taking into account what a missed kick would do field position-wise. And then we have a yard line designated for if it's an end of half or end of game, basically walk off, what's the line? So our end game line, to your point, has moved back a couple of yards just because of the confidence we have in Brett making a kick instead of you know, missing it and losing the field position advantage of it. And then our end of half end of game line has gone back a couple of yards just knowing that he has 60 plus range in him. So yes, to your point, with confidence in the kicker, that line moves. And so far, it has this year. And it's not, one kick's not going to make it move, but um, it's, a good, it's a good observation, yeah. Uh, big Bloss, Bird Cowboys Radio. Yeah. Um, John, your allocation of practice time, obviously you, you're going to have a stretch here, three straight at home, then Jacksonville, we assume it'll be warm, and then you got Washington at the end. Do you, do you change, like let's say the Green Bay game, where you know you might be, they might be bringing out more kicks and yeah. you might be the same? Does your allocation of practice time change with the what you expect of weather? Yeah, that's yeah. You guys got really good questions. <laughs> and I'm serious, and it's it's really fun to talk talk football with, you know, people that sometimes make me think about, you know, gosh, maybe maybe I should. <laughs> no, yeah, but uh, you know, to answer your question, it's a great point. I think we allocate most of our time, not most of our time, but a slight majority of our time into the punt and punt return world. But we haven't changed our allocation weekly based on the anticipation of more balls in play on kick, kick return compared to less balls in play on kick, kick return. Um, just in case you get into the game, like Minnesota, we ended up covering two kicks indoors um, and then you know, hoping, hoping we can get some kickoff return chances. But to your question, no, we haven't changed it. But it was kind of built in from the start to allocate just a little bit more into the punt, punt return world compared to kick, kick return. But it's always a good thought. When you guys had Simon Matheson for a trial back in the spring, he was involved in that track man technology yeah. that's really specific and analytical about how hard a ball was going, travel distance, estimation, and all that. Do you have, do you use, do you use that data or a similar analytics to decide, all right, our kicker or our punter isn't quite kicking with the same oomph as it was earlier in the year. Let's dial some back here as we get to the later months of the season. Or I don't know, is there any sort of adjustment period for, or adjustment for specialists as it relates to workload uh, to kind of take care of them? And how do you measure whether or not that's the Yeah, issue? that's part of the component that, that we do use. Um, maybe not tactically, but to your point, you know, what's the ball speed coming off the foot as the season's gone on? What's the trajectory? at basically the line of scrimmage as the season's gone on to, to make sure our standards of trajectory, um, ball speed. Um, there's a few other tracking mechanisms in there that's really cool that can give us some information based on our kind of baseline from training camp. Um, we haven't necessarily adapted anything yet because our kickers and punters haven't shown to have lost any power, which has been really cool. I think we have a really good team routine with Brett and Brian. Keeping their volume during the week low but very intentional about what they do, which I kind of learned last year with, with Brian. Um, he had such a great process that I thought he got better as the season went along. And never did I feel fatigue. And that's really where I feel with Brett and Brian right now too. Just even without the track mad dad, you kind of get a just feel for it. Um, but that, the numbers always, always do help. And it's really a really cool tool. Christy Scales, Cowboys Radio. With the spade of games coming up against AFC opponents, can you speak to the challenge of getting ready for uncommon opponents? And then on top of that, where a guy like Damone Clark, when he's doing 70% of defensive snaps and you're not having him for, for special teams, I yeah. guess there's an extra layer there for you. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. I think the uncommon opponent is maybe more for the players and it's our job to educate them on that. I think I can maybe just personally speak. Um, we have a pretty good feel even around the league for players and coaches and maybe what they like to do and a history of it. So the uncommon part, I think, is for a coach's job is to educate the players on who's uncommon to them based on just matchup wise. Um, and then the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and yep. you don't get them for teams. Yeah, and that's kind of the way the whole season has gone, really, is um, Anthony Barr may or may not be up, so Damone may or may not be available for special teams, which means Jabril Cox may or may not be dressed. And so my job as special teams coach is to try to get all those guys ready in, you know, in a few amount of reps during the week. But that's what we try to do is, you know, on a punt practice day, we try to get Jabril the majority of the reps. If we think Anthony Barr's not going to go and no one's going to start. So um, as, a, as, a, as a week goes on, you know, I really try to keep track of where I think it's trending for certain players to try to give them the majority of the work. But it doesn't always go that way for sure. Like, you know, Nashon ended up playing this past game because Kelvin Joseph was out kind of at the last second. So um, the good part about it is I can go into the meetings and say, hey, everybody's got to be ready to play. And this isn't just coach speak because this happened this week and this happened two weeks ago and this happened three weeks ago. You know, Malik Davis and Jabril Cox and Nashon Wright and, and go on and on. So it's, um, it makes it fun during the week for me to be able to try to make sure everybody's tuned in to potentially having to play this spot. Um, and then there's multiple times on Sunday where I come in with our game day cards and it's two hours before the game and I'll say, hey, this happened. And so, hey, you got to go here and you got to go here and you got to go here. So I feel like the week is never, <laughs> is never finished. It's always um, up until the first kickoff, just getting bodies ready to play some different spots they maybe didn't anticipate. Sorry for talking too much. We'll uh, wrap up with Michael. Dorrance Armstrong still sees the occasional uh, special teams work, but his work on defense has been noticeable to many. I know you've talked about being so happy when guys take the success that they have on special teams and build off it into offense or defense, but anything that has stood out to you just about how he in particular has gone about that? I'm not surprised at all. You know, when Dorrance Armstrong's, you know, he's starting to get some sacks and what we saw him do the previous years on punt team or punt return or covering kickoffs, it's, you know, you see a guy do that and it's like, yeah, that's, you know, he got the opportunity. I'm not surprised. That's probably what we figured he'd do. Like Tony Pollard, you know, playing on punt team and kickoff return the last couple of years or Donovan Wilson playing on all four phases, um, Noah Brown. I mean, you see all those guys that now have the opportunity to play more offense and defense. It's like, yeah, that's, that's about right. I'm not surprised Noah catches all the balls and Tony you know, has the running success he does and Dorrance can you know, tackle the quarterback because they kind of did it just in a um, not so noticeable world on special teams. But um, it's really cool to see those guys get those opportunities and um, make names for themselves. And that's kind of what special teams is for. It's like, come on in. We got, we got a role for you. Let's go, you know, whoever it might be on our team. And at some point, you might have this opportunity and you go, man. All right. Thank you, guys.